This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on Carolina Impact, how a family's loss inspired an annual event helping others deal with rare pediatric cancers. Plus, in our Bloomy Awards preview, we meet a teen who used to be in the show, now she's running the show. And we'll introduce you to a local man who's got the perfect dream job, working with some of the best entertainers around the world. Don't go anywhere, Carolina Impact starts right now. Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Good evening, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. According to the National Cancer Institute, nearly 2,000 children die of cancer every year in the U.S. 10 years ago, Joe Rostano was diagnosed with a rare form of bone cancer that took his life. Carolina Impact's Tanisha Johnson shows us how Joe's family continues to carry out his last wishes by raising money benefiting rare pediatric cancers. Get out of the truck, put your hands where I can see them. Each year, award-winning films debut at the Sundance Film Festival and go on to gross millions of dollars at the box office. How long before we get kicked off our own property? I reckon y'all got this place about another week. The popularity of this film festival got Diane and Mike Rostano thinking of ways to honor their son's last wishes. died seven years ago from a rare form of bone cancer called osteosarcoma. It was very hard to sit there and witness. He was 20 and had just finished his first semester at college. It was like the last thing you'd ever want to experience. Before Joe's death, he raised money for cancer awareness and research and donated it to the Levine Children's Hospital. Diane says he wanted her to continue raising support after his death, so they made a pact. He and I had a long talk, a long talk about raising funds for these cancers, trying to make a difference in their treatments. So I promised him I would raise money. I didn't know what I was going to do, but um, in my living room, over a glass of wine with my husband and my neighbor, we came up with a film festival. Eight months later, the Rostanos hosted the Joe Dance Film Festival in their backyard. They showed movies on the side of their home. About a dozen people attended. They raised about $1,000 and donated it to the Levine Children's Hospital where Joe received cancer treatments. I thought that was it because I thought everybody just came together to help us through a really hard time. We never started out thinking that's what we were going to do. It was really something to do just to try to ease the pain. Seven years later, this has morphed into way more than I ever expected. While the festival gives local filmmakers an opportunity to showcase their work, Diane says they've never forgotten the reason why they started the event. We use the creativity of film to promote cancer research and clinical trials. Today, the event attracts hundreds of people and raises about $25,000 annually. Dr. Javier Osterheld specializes in pediatric hematology and oncology at the Levine Children's Hospital. He says donations received from the Joe Dance Film Festival goes toward cancer research. They funded a summer intern where um, that person worked on mouse sores. It's one of the biggest complications of the chemotherapy we give. The Ristanos are grateful for what they've been able to do so far, making it easier for other cancer survivors. Not only have Joe's last wishes become a reality, now they're touching the lives of so many, including the caregivers of patients here at the hospital. Every other month, the Levine Children's Hospital hosts a spa day for the parents and caregivers of children hospitalized here. The Restanos came up with the idea four years ago, and with the help of stylists, nail techs, and massage therapists from Modern Salon and Spa, they've continued doing it ever since. As a parent, you know, I've never been in a situation like this, but to be able to give something of myself to them and make it about them, you know, for even for an hour, for them to just relax and have peace and vent if they want to, or just relax um, and just be here and know that I'm here for them. Ashley Howell's five-year-old son, Bryson, needs a heart transplant. It's nice that they come out and take their time and do it, you know, for us because we've been in here so long. Fortunately, she's got her mother's support during this difficult time. Both say getting a little pampering helps ease some of the stress they're facing. 
it rejuvenates you. I mean, it, it just makes you feel a lot better because um, you just, that's, you know, like, that's the last thing on your plate that you're going to have to worry about going to get your hair done or, you know, anything, a massage or whatever. As an event coordinator for the Levine Children's Hospital, Carrie Cuton says it can be physically and emotionally draining for parents who spend long periods of time here. When I see it's about them and I see that they're fulfilled, I feel it. It's, it's, it's in my heart. I've walked out of here with tears in my eyes because to see a smile on a mom's face that you hadn't seen in months, nothing short of amazing. Whether it's a spa day or hosting another film festival, the Restanos say helping others fight cancer is exactly what Joe inspired them to do. Wow. Yeah, it's a good feeling. It really is. Hard to put into words. But just to know, and, and how fortunate were we would to have that time so we would know his wishes and we could work towards them. It is certainly has twisted my life around um, from being the recipient to now wanting to be a giver. Although nothing replaces the void the Restanos feel, they take comfort in knowing that the Joe Dance Film Festival continues to support cancer research. For Carolina Impact, I'm Tanisha Johnson reporting. So far, more than $120,000 have been raised and donated to the Levine Children's Hospital from this event. The 8th Annual Joe Dance Film Festival takes place August 4th and 5th. You can find more information about it on our website at pbscharlotte.org. High school musical season is mostly over here in the Charlotte region, but as the curtain closes on all those great performances, the Bloomy Awards roll out the red carpet. The Bloomies honor the best from 46 schools across 10 counties this year, and you can see all those terrific teens perform only on PBS Charlotte. In this week's Bloomy preview, Jeff Sonier is on stage at the Blumenthal with more on the former Bloomy Award nominee who's directing this year, even though she's still just a teen. Yeah, Amy, you know, everybody here at the Bloomies knows that every high school musical or play needs a director, someone to pull all the pieces together, both on stage and off stage. Someone with theater training and experience and education. Usually it's somebody already at the school, usually a theater teacher, but sometimes fate forces you to find your someone somewhere else. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here at South Lake Christian Academy to witness a transformation. Yes, time is definitely of the essence. It's we saw sort of show up here and push up our sleeves and work. Even our cast members help build sets and props and we're pulling things from all different areas of the school and just kind of running around like minions <laughs> and making it, just pulling it all together. In a few crazy hours after Sunday services, South Lake transforms this church gym into the high school musical Little Mermaid. And that sets the stage, yeah, it literally sets the stage for another transformation. This is wonderful. It's, it's really helped me to just be more comfortable in my own skin and be more confident in myself. As these kids become their characters. Did your father know about this place? Yeah, it's really helped me to uh, come out of my shell. No pun intended. Um. It's brought me out of my comfort zone, that's for sure. I never in a million years would have thought singing or acting was something that I was even good at. And so I've always wanted to be a part of it because I saw how much of a family they were. I sit in this throne and I kind of just uh, look out over the audience and over uh, all the sea creatures. For many years ago, on this fateful day, I inherited my father's kingdom. When the curtain opens and you see everyone and you hear everyone, it's mind-blowing. It's awesome. Under the sea, under the sea. For the seniors, it never gets old being on stage. And for the newcomers? I've always been in the audience, and so the first time coming up here, it's a whole new world, a whole new perspective, and I love it. For me, theater is a really great like, creative outlet for me, and it helps me express who I am. It's just totally different for me, but I, I'm, I'm really excited about it. Alexa Wallace technically isn't a newcomer. She's been in South Lake musicals before, but two years after graduating, she's never been in charge of a musical before. The scene before was a little slow, so just pick up the lines faster. 
Now, at age 19, Alexa's the director. No training, no experience, no problem. Looks like South Lakes found there someone. I knew that the old director wasn't going to come back, and that's when the administration actually approached me. They said, we would love for you to do it. You've, you know how this works, you know the kids. And I, I thought about it a lot, and I just was like, yeah, sure. It's okay. You're not on the beat perfectly. You can say it freely. That's how it's written, so that's fine. It's not that I love being in charge, but I love watching my ideas. Does that make sense? I, I like how, I like seeing my ideas played out, like literally played out on stage for me. Alexa scribbles notes on a pad during rehearsals on the same stage where not so long ago she used to rehearse. I know what this feels like. I was there two years ago. I was in your shoes and I can really connect with the kids that way. It haunts my dreams and spins me round. And not surprisingly, the kids connect with her too. As her first year's director, it's amazing what she's done so far. Just from every little detail that she's been able to put all together. Uh, from the stress that she has to carry. She's handled with it so well, and even on some of the bad days, she's really loving and helps us get through everything. I was in two performances with her, my freshman and sophomore year, and I got to watch her when I was younger, and I totally looked up to her. It warms my heart, honestly. That sounds cheesy, but it really does. It, I love that that all these kids are passionate about the play and about the role they take on stage and how much fun they can have. Yeah, just reading the uh, South Lake program for The Little Mermaid inside the front cover, a word from the director, Alexa writes, that you might see a little of yourself in this young girl and maybe Alexa sees a little bit of herself in this young girl too. Amy. Thanks so much, Jeff. Joining me now is Jay Everett, Senior Vice President of Community Affairs at Wells Fargo. Jay, we always appreciate your time. Thank you. It's always great to be here. This is my favorite time of year because I love talking about the Bloomy Awards. Mm -hmm. And we love showcasing terrific teens in this way. But it's not just about their skills as performers, is it? You're right, Amy. It's interesting. One of the reasons that Wells Fargo's foundation continues to support the Bloomy Awards now for the sixth year in a row is that behind all of that enthusiasm and talent and engagement you see from those students and uh, the teachers and the school support they receive for these incredible performances is research that shows that students that are engaged with arts education programming always perform better in programs like SAT testing. They do better in mathematics and English language arts in school as well. And so there's actually an academic impact that in kind of engaging with the arts with these students at this level has with them and our foundation is all about helping students achieve and so we see both connections kind of that public fun face but then also pedagogical research that shows that these experiences are going to help these students perform better in life because it's hard work it's focus mm -hmm. so many great things that we love to see on the night of the awards another thing we want to talk about students here have a great reputation of going on nationally. And a lot of people mm -hmm. just think it's our little local community of Charlotte. But last year, we had great success at what's called the Jimmy Awards, right. which happened in New York City. Help right. talk to us a little about the connection between Charlotte and the Jimmy Awards. You're right. There's so much focus on the Bloomy Awards here in Charlotte, but there is a national program that these types of local competitions all across the country move up to the Jimmy Awards and it's a national platform program to bring the best actresses and best actors from these local and regional groups to the national stage in New York and they are coached and they get experience, they perform on Broadway, they're in front of talent scouts and it's just a tremendous opportunity for these students to move to the next level to showcase their talent. And last year, the Best Actress here in Charlotte uh -huh. went on to win the National Best Actress Award. Amina Faye, we're so proud of her. Absolutely. Did a great job Absolutely. at the Jimmys. But even Wells Fargo is getting involved with the Jimmys this year also. Well, our local engagement with the Blumenthal Performing Arts here and the Bloomy Awards helped expose us to this national level program. And so again, 
With the Wells Fargo Foundation, another area that we focus on beyond student achievement is recognizing and rewarding and encouraging outstanding teachers and teaching. And so for the first time, Wells Fargo is going to be sponsoring the national level Jimmy Award, recognizing outstanding drama teachers and the teachers that do so much to make these high school musical theater students learn and help them feel engaged and give them these opportunities. So we're excited about that as well. Where would we be without great teachers in our lives? Uh, absolutely. You know, talk to us, so you've got a commitment locally, nationally, but I see a theme here. I see mm -hmm. the arts. Right, right. And this is a difficult time for the arts. Sometimes folks don't see it as critical to a community. Mm -hmm. Why do you see it as critical to the community? You know, unfortunately, arts education programs are typically one of the first programs that are cut anytime there is a budget challenge. And sometimes that can come from local forces and sometimes it's national. But when you do look at the research, I mean studies from UCLA and other organizations that show the positive correlation between students and exposure to art and their academic performance, I think you'd argue that the arts are actually vital to education as opposed to ancillary to education. And it's just a time where all of us need to stop and ask, you know, do we understand that and are we willing to be committed to it and are we willing to advocate to support arts programming and arts funding. It's important. Well, Jay, we appreciate the fact that not only do you support the Bloomies, but you support PBS Charlotte to be able to broadcast the Bloomies. Mm -hmm. And we're grateful because it's all about partnerships. It is, and we're excited to work with you guys on that. Y'all do such a great job, and you're able to film and capture the experience of the live night performance and bring it to the community. And WTVI is excellent about engaging with the community and making programming accessible. It's, it's such a positive, a program that we love the fact that you help make it available for this greater you know, region and, and people that can't make it the night of the actual performances. Well, we like to say teamwork makes the dream work and thank you for like being that. an important part of our team here. Jay Everett, Senior Vice President of Community Affairs at Wells Fargo, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Amy. You can watch the Bloomy Awards on Tuesday, May 30th, right here on PBS Charlotte. For additional air dates and times, please check our website at pbscharlotte.org. Well, one Charlotte man makes a living working with big time musicians and classic artists you and I have heard for years. Carolina Impact's Danielle Koser explains how passion and persistence helped Larry Farber land his dream job. With a front row seat to concerts like this, Larry Farber is living his dream. Well, I've been really lucky and I've, I've done something that I've loved. I've provided fun for other people, memories. We don't miss the fight, you're standing with the rest of us. And I've experienced things in the music world that I could have only dreamed about. He's the senior partner at East Coast Entertainment, recently rebranded as ECE. The company is a booking agency, providing talent to almost every event in the southeast part of the country, from weddings to corporate events to private parties. ECE has 14 offices from New York to Florida. Farber has worked in the music industry for 43 years, but his love for music spans a lifetime. He started his first band at age 12, spending hours pounding away at the keys on this piano. That piano elicits a lot of memories. When I look at it, it not only brings back the memories of where I played, but also the different musicians that were part of my life growing up. Now, the piano sits in his office as he pounds away on a different keyboard, still pursuing his passion. And this is where I am every day, answering the phone, booking bands. Today, Farber works with the same artist he grew up listening to. Watch what happens. Watch. Getting a sneak peek into their lives. All I'm asking is for respect when you come home. Some of his baby. most memorable moments. Paying Aretha Franklin in cold, hard cash for her performance. So I have the memory of going backstage with her, sitting there with the Queen of Soul, counting out her money. and making a quick stop for Smokey Robinson before he went on stage. He got there and he forgot his, you know, his special pants that he wore and having to go run back to the hotel to pick them up. In 2007, Farber founded Music with Friends, a members only music club that hosts a handful of concerts at McLowan Theater throughout the year. So it becomes a night 
not just of music, but of night of experiencing the food, the friendship, and the music together. Recently, the club hosted Nora Jones. From the cocktails to the camaraderie, the small, intimate venue, paired with larger-than-life artists, is a hit. Membership is about $1,600 annually, and it's almost sold out. Here, it's a real intimate experience. The artists really engage with the audience, which is very special, and it's just a very unique experience where you really feel like you're a part of the show. Here's the catch. Members don't know which artists will be performing when they pay their yearly dues. One thing they can count on, the classics. It's people that you grew up with and listened to over the years, from Tony Bennett to Jackson Brown to Glenn uh, Fry to uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash. He really spends a lot of time talking to members and trying to find out what their interests are, who their favorite artists are. Barber spends a lot of time preparing for the performances, making sure the musicians' requirements are met. Please welcome Chicago! Once the curtains open, the hard work pays off. Aretha uh, Franklin just retired, and we had her the, the day after Whitney Houston passed away. So she put on this incredible performance as a tribute to Whitney, and that's a memory of a lifetime. I know I'm very, very lucky and fortunate to have been part of that kind of history. Nora's show is going to be more of a listening type thing. Yeah. Chris McClure works behind the scenes as a show producer, making sure the artists have the right equipment. He's worked with Farber for 15 years. He's really helped me grow because of the fact that he's mentored me in the relationship-based uh, part of our business. After more than four decades in the music industry, Farber says retirement is finally on the horizon. I'm a firm believer, too, that, that music uh, is a moment in time. When you find something that you're passionate about, really passionate about, it's not a job. Passion sparked by this piano symbolizing how one boy's dream helped turn ECE into one of the largest entertainment companies in the country. For Carolina Impact, I'm Danielle Koser reporting. Thanks so much, Danielle. In addition to his role at East Coast Entertainment, Larry's incredibly active in our community. He served as a board member of the Family Center and the Shelter for Battered Women, and as president of the Carolina's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Well, Whataburger drive-in restaurants of Cabarrus and Iredale counties will take you back to the good old days of Elvis, drive-in movies, and Leave it to Beaver, of course. Customers still drive up, place orders on a call box, and have food delivered right to their cars. In tonight's Carolina Cooking segment, Jason Terzos takes us back in time where the past meets the present. It was the place to be singing, dancing, all kinds of entertainment. Well, it was popular with young people that it would be hangouts, more or less. The Whataburger drive-in restaurants of Concord, Kannapolis, and Mooresville. In Concord, uh, number seven was a big hangout for one of the schools. What started as a local drive-in burger joint in the mid-1950s quickly grew to be a regional powerhouse. But this was the place to come back in the 60s. It was a hopping, pretty much a hopping place. The food first drew people in back then, and it's the food that still keeps them coming back now. I've been coming here since as long as I can remember. With all the change that's gone on in this area, it's just wonderful to come to a place that's, um, that's been here forever. It has such tradition. Every time I get a chance, I try to come up here. The first Whataburger opened in North Kannapolis. It then evolved to 15 locations covering five counties. Business grew from 1955 on. They're impossible to miss. Each Whataburger has a giant sign out front with a number inside a star. The number indicates which Whataburger it is in order that they opened. Because number one was Kannapolis, like I say, number two, Concord, three, Belmont, and so forth. When uh, we have call-in orders, well, it's Whataburger number two, or it's Whataburger number 11. Mike Bost used to spend summers working for his dad, but he never thought Whataburger would become his life's work. When I graduated uh, in 1970, 71, from UNCC, nobody was hiring, and uh, 
My father needed me, so I went to work out of the office and warehouse. And Mike's been here ever since, taking over ownership when his father died in 1989. The exception of one year since 70, I've been working in these places. Angela Martin spent her childhood coming to the Whataburger in Mooresville. Her parents often spent dates here back in the 1960s. And they still come here. They come every week mostly. Usually it's uh, Fridays or Saturdays, and they still come in and get takeout. Angela practically grew up with the place. That's one of the many reasons why she likes it so much. When I was a little girl, we'd always come get takeout. My parents back then didn't have a lot of fast food restaurants. They weren't here. And this was the only place that you could really come, call in an order and come pick it up, or you could come, sit in your car, have it delivered and eat it in the car. And it still feels like the 50s when you drive in. Customers place their orders on old school call boxes. I'd like the what a cheeseburger, please, and a small french fry. Inside, orders are written down. One and bacon. And servers bring it to customers curbside, just like the old days. This is just one of the last iconic places that you can come to and have a little nostalgia in your life. <laughs> I think it's awesome that it still looks the way it did a long time ago. But a place can't run on nostalgia alone. Serving fresh ground beef, never frozen patties, with food always cooked to order, never ahead of time, has been the key to 60 plus years of success. I did have a gentleman tell me one time, he said, I think that your success lies in the fact that you have good word of mouth, you've got good clientele, but you haven't changed a thing. Your sandwich is still the original. It's delicious. Uh, it's. I don't know how to explain it, it's just, it's better than anything else around here. We'll use fresh ground beef, we believe in that, we do not want to go to a, a frozen patty. Food to order, I think that's another key, you can't make food to here. Friday night football is huge in Mooresville, it's a big thing in Mooresville. And on Friday nights, a lot of the kids, the football players will come down, they'll eat before the game, they'll walk down because they can't leave school usually, they'll walk down and eat and people come here and hang out and eat because it's just right here by the high school. There are actually three separate Whataburger chains. The one here in the Carolinas, one in Virginia, and the major one with 800 locations based out of Texas. Huge crowds may not gather locally like they once did. Times change, but Whataburger hasn't. Just trying to make our clientele happy. Just good food, good service, that's it. So with all the rapid growth and everybody in a hurry, it's just nice to sit here, relax, have a delicious Whataburger um, with all the trimmings and um, just sit and think about old times. Mike says he's had plenty of offers over the years to sell his Whataburger restaurants, but he's not interested. We've got uh, good people working for us. As long as we can do that we'll, and we've got the business, we'll do it. He'd like to keep the family business in the family for as long as possible. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jason Terzis reporting. Thanks so much, Jason. But before we leave this evening, we want to invite you to like us on Facebook. We post previews from local and national shows there, and you get a chance to see a preview of Carolina Impact. We always do Facebook Live, promoting Carolina Impact every Thursday around 10 a.m. If you had tuned in a couple of weeks ago, you would have seen the fact that we had a studio audience with our friends from Southminster joining us on this day. So you won't want to miss it. Sign up for Facebook Live today. Well, that does it for us tonight. Thanks so much for your time. We always appreciate it, and we look forward to seeing you back here again next time on Carolina Impact. Good night, my friends. of PBS Charlotte.